welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're here to talk about domain-driven design when surrounded by legacy, government edition. We wanted to start with just a question for the audience. Uh, how many of you have experienced working uh, with federal systems or state systems in any way? Oh, Ooh, this is awesome. All right. A lot we'll more than it's a very different audience that John prepared before, so we'll see how this goes. It's like they don't know anything about government. <laughs> teach, teach them everything. So John brought me to set the scene. In 2020, John and I are on a small cross-functional team and we're contracted to create shared understanding and then consensus behind strategies to modernize a behemoth of a federal benefit system in a human-centered way. We're trying to peel apart a huge onion and we're learning more and more every week that there are more layers and it's starting to feel like this onion might be unpeelable. It's pro the system processes four million claims a night using three million lines of COBOL code. It provides green screen interfaces to 12 administrative contractors with thousands of employees who are managing the payment of $300 billion of ev to every kind of provider or doctor and healthcare facility you can imagine. And it's the result of years and years of layered regulations one on top of another. We've spent days trying to unravel flat file layouts and processing file tree diagrams, to understand systems that interface with systems that interface with systems to process a claim. And there are no data models to speak of, which John is loving. And our HCD researchers and UX designers and our team are particularly frustrated because we're not spending any time talking about the people who are working with the system, the people who get benefits from the system, or people who get paid by the system. And conversations abound across the program about retirement. Everybody is looking for something to strangle in the program. It is clear that Strangler Pattern has great SEO. And we're searching for case studies of other large, uh, highly regulated uh, modernization efforts that might match ours. And as you can imagine, we're not coming up with anything. Then John gets all eager and sends me an email telling me he's found a PDF online. The title is Getting Started with DDD Surrounded by Legacy. And you know you're in a special place when that tile hits. And this will be an inflection point for us. John will talk about the specifics from an engineer and an architect's perspective, but from, an in, from a product person's perspective, DDD laid out a really compe compelling set of priorities beyond system-specific thinking that helped dissect foundational needs like using ubiquitous language to create shared understanding and direct communication between stakeholders, policy experts, and engineers, decomposing monolithic systems with a focus on business context, Acknowledging the true cost of integrating within, uh, with a legacy system, which is a lot of focus on the system that did exist and a lot less focus on your users. And trying to separate development teams from having to understand everything about everything in the system to build anything in the system. But before we continue, let us introduce ourselves. I'm Adrian. I spent my, started my career in business intelligence, software, and analytics. Uh, then had the pleasure of moving to civil service where I spent nine years at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. During my time there, I got to see a real revolution in uh, the legislation that governs uh, the way that we deliver healthcare. And over the last few years there, I also got to participate in teams that were adapting, uh, adopting agile practices, DevOps practices, and HCD type practices. Now, uh, I work in the private sector, uh, contracting with the government to solve these kinds of problems and working with people like John. Oh, thanks, Adrian. I, my name is John. I run a small consultancy named Kind uh, Systems. We work in government spaces looking for impactful problems to solve using our startup toolbox. We also still work in startups as well. Um, but unlike Adrian, I've never been a Fed or worked in government, but I've been in civic tech for about the past five years and kind of this shift to digital services and trying to deliver value in different ways than the norm. So I'll hand this all over to John here in just a second, but let's first talk context. John emphasized the need to talk context. And big picture context, how is government different than working in the commercial sector? The first is everything is huge, uh, both from the size of the organizations to the size of the programs. When you release a program in Medicare, you're releasing it to millions of people or, or hundreds of thousands of doctors or tens of thousands of facilities. And often, in the way the systems were created, uh, a lot of the functionality was expected to be delivered in waterfall methodologies and to be available on the first day. They're risk adverse because of the impacts to making a mistake uh, in a benefit system are, are hugely impactful and petrifying. Systems have incredibly long lifespans because each program, by the time they establish their 
infrastructure uh, and the technology they want to run on, they spend most of their time uh, through the course of the year operating the program and then adapting to changes in legislation year over year. Uh, I like to think of regulation as the silent stakeholder, but it may have the loudest voice and it often drowns out the voice of users and user need. Subject matter experts are often part of the contractor team, so if you want to learn about systems and operations, you're really looking to get uh, the expertise from contractors. And the goal, at least at this time, for almost all the IT projects was that the definition of success was to get to an operation and maintenance phase. <laughs> I often felt like my experience with government was the difference was more money in government created more problems. And that's the way it was for the first five years of my experience, and then healthcare.gov happened. The failures of the initial launch to the signature uh, piece of President Obama's signature legislation really flipped the apple cart. It caused a lot of really important people to change their view on what acceptable risk in software was. And over the subsequent two years of picking that thing back up, uh, the government learned a lot about how its antiquated approaches to developing software were actually generating more risk, not less. Also, from this maelstrom, emerged uh, what John and I work in, the, ci the civic digital tech movement, both within the federal government and its contracting teams. The USDS playbook is a, does an awesome job of capturing the key themes that the government aims to emulate uh, from private sector activity, but in government context, most importantly, to deliver better services to people, to citizens. And as a result, there really has been tangible change. I think one prime example is the way the contracts are now often created. Contracts have moved to a place where they're often now state the objectives to be achieved as opposed to listing out all the work to be done, which you can imagine could be problematic when trying to have a multi-year IT project. There is much more obtaining of cross-functional expertise of designers, product managers, architects, and engineers for the projects. And there's a constant reassessment of priorities within contract structures and a move to a more DevOps mindset. But with these new ways of working come new challenges for our colleagues in the federal government. Our Fed colleagues are rapidly evolving their approaches to managing IT delivery, and they're instantly shouldering more responsibility and accountability for setting priorities from the design through the delivery phase. These new contracting strategies also require them to decompose complex business and system needs into well-bounded objectives that yield discrete services and products. One of the reasons I found DDD particularly appealing was for this need. However, the organizations that they work in are still con con um, working in outdated and legacy ways around them. So they're facing particular obstacles or significant obstacles in working agilely. Also, often their executive leadership and their stakeholders don't have an aligned vision of where they want to get to. So it, with little momentum in the organization, it often falls on these same people, not only to lead the adoption of agile, but to bring their business partners along with them to believe that delivering agilely can work for them. I think this is where our part, uh, our, the, our work can be as much art uh, as it is science, and that's how do we craft a plan to help agencies go from where they are to where they want to be, or at least to where some people in those agencies want to be. So today, there's really three things we thought would be uh, relevant for this audience. How we use DDD is an integral part of crafting an approach to modernizing a huge system that we hope will be successful. The successes and failures that we experienced along the way and how we think our colleagues in the civic tech community, of which there are way more than we thought there'd be here, which is awesome, uh, might be able to take this even further and uh, gain even greater benefit uh, for the public. Great, so thanks Adrian. Before we dive deeper into Medicare, I wanna talk just a quick recap of Eric's four strategies when surrounded by legacy. So this is a pamphlet um, that he published a while back and there's uh, the first strategy. So the bubble context. So this is a small but new bounded context. It's established with the anti-corruption layer, and the, the key here is to let you innovate without the constraints of your legacy processes or systems. So in the Medicare world, this often meant not making the engineers learn COBOL, not making them learn how EDI files work, in order for them to even start developing new code. Second, so still in the bounded context, an autonomous bubble. So now we have a bubble that runs its own software it runs apart from the legacy system and has, has its own data store. The important thing here is the data store has data that's in the new context, right? So you're starting to separate out, creating options for yourself. And the idea here is to be able to test and innovate separately from the legacy system. Oftentimes there's capabilities in these legacy systems, data that we don't necessarily want to replace quite yet. 
And so Eric suggests using an open host service in order to deliver these types of capabilities, these legacy capabilities, but over a protocol instead. So you get to reuse a bit of that. And finally, Eric discusses what to consider after you expand your new bubble. Um, coordinating incremental development between your bubble and then your anti-corruption layer, keeping those in sync, only bringing the data that you need, and then thinking carefully when you do need to bring in additional data um, that you model it with care, just like if you were on, in a greenfield project. So I hope that's a good uh, refresher for some of you, but a good summary if you haven't encountered these strategies before. I'm gonna hand it back to Adrian to teach you everything he knows about Medicare for the next 16 hours. Exactly. Uh, so Medicare is a national health insurance program. Uh, it's for people 65 and over, and then with certain conditions uh, um, and disabilities, you can have it earlier. Um, in that, uh, you are, we are paying for Medicare policies Government gets funded in many ways, so give me a little leeway. But generally in two ways. One is the pay payroll taxes that you all, we all are paying on our payroll taxes. And then when you get a policy, the premiums you pay every month will be another large portion of that money. That's the money that the government is using to pay for the services that people enrolled in Medicare are receiving. Um, the way it does so is in response to medical claims. So it receives a medical claim and it pays in response to that. And so I hear nobody here asking, what's a medical claim? I'll tell you anyways. It's a request from a provider uh, for payment for services that they've provided to someone enrolled in Medicare. Typically, it's gonna have information on the diagnoses they've received, one or more, and then the services or procedures or drugs or products that the, that the healthcare professional has decided that they needed to have. And Secondly, most of them get accepted, and when it does, it then becomes a record of Medicare having paid a doctor for a particular set of service provided to a beneficiary. And that really brings up, I think, three large domains, uh, gov-sized domains, for us maybe to explore here quickly before handing it back over to John. The first is the person who has the policy is the beneficiary of the policy. And there are cornucopia of rules around what is covered, when is covered, how much is covered, and what it means to have other insurances. The second are doctors and healthcare facilities that are the providers of services, of healthcare services. They're known generally as providers, as confusing as that is. Um, and there's a panoply of rules around that, as you expect. Everything from, obviously, all specialties have a whole different sets of rules, cardiologists and primary care physicians. Uh, vers also, the differences between services being rendered in rural Wyoming versus downtown Denver. Also, all providers are regulated by state rules, so Medicare needs to be able to account for all of those rules. And then the last domain uh, that we'll touch here quickly before handing it back is uh, claims. It's both a highly regulated electronic transaction with really strict coding rules, and at the same time, it's also this kind of representation between uh, an encounter between a provider, a doctor, and a person who needed care. And it's those two things at the same time. The challenge here is that each of these domains have policies that are specific to them, and those regulations are updated every year, at least, in, 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 uh, uh, get updates every year that can be everything from large to small. And it's the layering of these successive regulations and sub-regulations and regulatory guidance uh, that end up being often cumulative um, that cause the core complexity in this system. And processing any one claim requires invoking rules from all of these domains, some number of rules, depending on what it is that that claim is actually re requesting. Um, so to make this complexity understandable, one of the things our team did was to create a mental model of what is actually happening. What is the system trying to ask of the claim to interrogate it? We came up with this as a high-level five-question outline, and then there's some series associated outcomes. Who is Medicare paying and covering? Is it a valid billing company? Does the beneficiary currently have a current policy? Is the doctor in good standing in their state? What is Medicare covering? Is this the type of service it should cover? Does it make sense given the diagnosis? Is this being paid along with their combination of services that make sense together? Why is Medicare permitted to cover this or not permitted to cover this? Uh, how often has this been service been performed? How often is it allowed to be performed? Uh, has this person been seen by other doctors at the same time? How much will Medicare allow to be paid for this claim? There's a combination of for this service, for this type of healthcare professional, in this setting, in this geographic area, what would be the maximum allowed that Medicare would allow to pay? And then wrapping it up with who owes what to whom? 
So if we take factors like how much a person has paid in deductibles or uh, co-pays in the year and their co-insurance amounts, how much will the beneficiary and the provider owe the doctor at the end of the day? So the legacy system accommodates all this complexity. So why modernize it? And I think the headline might read, uh, new policies, bigger program, and a need for a system that supports users as opposed to the vice versa. The new generation of policies are really looking to move aggressively away for fee-for-service, where you pay for one fee for every service that's rendered by a doctor because it creates negative incentives, because doctors get paid for the more services they render as opposed to the kinds of quality of care they provide, the effectiveness of the care they provide to their patients. And so they're looking right now, and have been for years, to augment those numbers with calculations of what is the quality of care that this provider provides on average? What are the outcomes that beneficiaries see when they see these providers? And trying to find a way to augment the price you pay on a claim with that number to change the incentives. These are some of the challenges you can imagine trying to integrate into a massive benefit system that the new system will have to support. Second, we've all heard the baby boomers are retiring. Um, and that this system is built on COBOL batch uh, file process that runs overnight. And there are only so many minutes overnight. Eventually, the nighttime time frame will run out of time. Better solve that problem before you get there. And the third is that right now, the processes in the system, um, it, it prioritize the efficiency and the effectiveness and speed of the system to the detriment of many human-centered elements. Um, as an example, uh, uh, Trying to onboard new users is incredibly difficult. Trying to look at the processing in the system to understand how a claim is processed, um, we have not yet been successful in doing that. There is no capability to build end user interfaces with workflows that would facilitate onboarding new users. So these are some of the kinds of challenges uh, that, that, that we encountered and that John and I and the team really wanted to see in this prototype of a thin thread and a platform. John, why don't you talk about the prototype? Before I talk about the prototype, um, I want to talk about how we even brought DDD to Medicare. So four years ago, DDD was relatively new to me. It was very new to the product folks, to the designers, and to the researchers on the team. So the important note here is that we're a cross-functional research team, not a development team. Um, but I, as an engineer and an architect, found that the human-centered design was it already felt familiar. It, it felt like I was getting terminology for things that I already knew to be true, but just didn't have a name for it. Um, and so I dove into DDD. Uh, and it's one thing to learn how to start to practice it, but it's an entirely different thing to be able to teach it and then to be able to defend it and, and sell it to other folks. So um, I'll call up just a couple of people in this room that, that really helped me along the way. So Eric, Chris, Alberto, um, Nick, but just people that were so generous with their resources to uh, just create free products and, and books that I can read and, 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 and teach to other people, so I'm grateful for that. But once we started applying DDD, we were very excited about the clarity that we got. We had concepts that um, you know we had names for now, so we started teaching people about DDD. We used uh, sourdough and uh, baking metaphors because this was early pandemic, and that's what everyone was thinking about at the time. And so the real innovation for us was being able to take something that Adrian described as very transactional, right? This is something that you use to move money from one place to another place, and instead start to remodel things into richer domain-driven mental models, and this is what we were, were hoping to spread. We didn't get very far, though. Um, as a research team and not a development team, we really had to make this compelling case for change and what is a risk-averse uh, organization I'll let everyone take pictures of the poop emoji. Um, but why did it fail, right? So people were too busy. Uh, apparently running the world's largest uh, medical payment system in the world is busy. Um, it was too technical. We were using words like ubiquitous, and people were just like, stop saying weird things. Um, and there wasn't a reason to change yet, and I think that was the key thing. And that's foreshadowing, if you, if you missed it. So the jump between waterfall, transactional code, from flat files, and then all of a sudden, Adrian's trying to convince them to be agile, I'm trying to convince them to be domain-driven, and then we're all saying, you need to move to relational cloud databases. It was just too much. It was too much for these people at one time, and particularly for the non-technical stakeholders. And so we knew that we had to find a way to demonstrate it, right? We couldn't just keep talking about it. And we'd gotten a lot of clarity about these mental models, right? So that's where we started. We, we already started drawing these um, diagrams. And you can see they're circles. 
bubbles-ish. Um, and so at CMS, everything felt like it revolved around these massive systems. People only wanted to talk about the acronyms and these systems and what the systems did. Um, and as Adrian mentioned, the, the researchers and the service designers were getting horribly frustrated. They wanted to talk about users. They didn't want to talk about systems. And so this concept of a claim spanned multiple systems and multiple teams. And we kept seeing this repeated uh, logic that would get repeated in these systems. And note here, I'm not using the word domain. I'm not using the word bounded context because it didn't feel designed. It felt like something that organically developed over the decades. And, it, and that's probably, not probably, that is what happened. So we started sharing our interpretations of Medicare domains. And people found it refreshing. It was not centered on the systems. It was centered on the processes and on the people. Uh, and people started to see where they contributed. People wanted to know where they fit in. They didn't want to know what monolith all their work was, was going into and getting hidden in. They wanted to know what, how they contributed. I'm not going to read all these words. But there were many teams working on modernization. We certainly were not the only one. And there was a very successful pilot that migrated a couple of modules that calculated prices for professional services. And this was huge. At the time, there was no cloud-based uh, migrations that successfully happened yet. And so moving from COBOL mainframe to cloud-based Java really opened the door. That, that planted a flag for us that this can be done. Um, and so riding on that momentum, our team was created um, along the way, we evaluated dozens of incremental modernization targets, and we were finding there weren't very many options. And so during this time, the legacy systems continued to hum along, but the change requests, as Adrian said, these are getting updated multiple times a year. And I'll talk a little bit more about the systems themselves, um, but this was not easy. These were change requests that would take in the period of nine months to, to get to production each time. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about these shared systems. Unfortunately, I can't just grab a, a, a screenshot of one of these diagrams. Uh, I'll get fired. Um, but I assure you that this Dolly-generated diagram looks exactly the same, uh, except that the Dolly diagram, uh, well, it looks better, one, and the other diagram was created in PowerPoint, and you can tell. So these distributed monoliths are tightly coupled. So distributed monolith, I don't, I, I don't think I made up this term, but that's the best thing I've got, right? These are highly, highly coupled systems. They have low cohesion. I see a lot of nodding, so people, other people have encountered distributed monoliths as well. Uh, lots of replication. And the other really interesting thing here is the human element. There's very, very high communication costs between the teams that maintain these systems, CMS itself, and then uh, the administrative contractors, so the people that are actually talking to the doctors and cutting the checks. Um, and so that's another kind of... Uh, element that you have to understand. As Adrian said, the three million lines of COBOL. So COBOL, business-oriented language, does a fantastic, elegant job of, of describing business logic, but it lacks encapsulation. It's really, really difficult to use. And if you've ever encountered a COBOL copy book before, it's not something I wish upon most people. Dozens of separate instances of the same systems. So what I mean by that is that you take a stack, and then you deploy it at one administrator contractor, and then you deploy that a dozen times. And so they're all running slightly customized, different versions of the same software that needs to be deployed at the same time. If that sounds like a deployment nightmare or a coordination nightmare, it is. Final one, my favorite acronym, virtual storage access method. So I'm just gonna read you straight from the IBM ZOS docs. VSAM keeps disk records in a unique format that is not understandable by other access methods. That's all you need to know. We can't bring this data to the cloud. It's in the IBM documentation. That's not what they meant, but I'm going to run with it. So despite everything I've told you, this is the reality of working in government. The shared systems have very, very impressive uptime. They require barely any human interaction for the vast majority, like 99.9999 percent of claims. And they have very, very low operational cost per unit. So it costs less for Medicare to process a medical claim than any private payer. So think about that for a moment. So why are we, why am I even here? Why is Adrian here? Why are we on a project, on a team that thinks about modernization? Um, so I want to point out three different shifts that have happened since the systems uh, were architected. Number one, the policies have shifted. So as Adrian mentioned, 
this started out by paying for individual transactions for a service that's been provided. And we've shifted to value-based care, right? We care about outcomes now. We care about how healthy are these 65-year-old folks, how, how healthy are these disabled folks. That's how we want to measure it now. Medicare programs have shifted. So we've gone from optimizing for processing speed and volume, and now we care about being able to make real-time policy, being able to make real-time operational decisions. I don't know if you guys know, but like this pandemic thing happened like a few years back. Um, so apparently, you know, healthcare needs to make really fast decisions now. We weren't set up for that. Service delivery and operations. So a shift from paying and efficiency. I, I think of this, uh, I also work in FinTech, so I think about paying things efficiently. Um, now we're thinking about what does it look like to have continuous visibility into the processes and the services, right? And so in, in the government context, we're talking about digital services, right? How do we provide benefits back to our residents, to our citizens? Here's the punchline. Systems were designed for how medical services were paid for, how people worked, and what technologies were available three decades ago. And that's not an exaggeration. Like, Someone looked at my side and said, are you sure that's not 50? And I went back and, and put 30, because I started at 20. Um, that's not all. So we're at a DDD conference, so I got to talk about the social technical challenges as well. SMEs are understandably busy people. So as I said, they're, they're running the world's largest healthcare payer system. <laughs> so they have better things to do than to talk to, uh, certainly to me, maybe not to Adrian. He has a lot of friends. Um, Incremental modernization at this point has required a lot of le legacy expertise. So COBOL's not being taught in college. Um, you know, EDI is painful. There are quote unquote open standards that you have to pay for. Um, and then copy books, copy books. Um, silos, silos of knowledge, silos of responsibilities, silos of incentives. Everyone kind of has a slightly different thing that they want. And then this is an interesting one for government in particular. We can't change the team topographies. I'm like looking straight at Nick right now. Um, organizational structures and contract structures, as Adrian said, they're not malleable and we're contractors. So we certainly can't change these things. Um, and that makes things difficult. You, you basically have to work with the teams and the settings that you have. And I, uh, Adrian and I both have the name in our head of the person that says this, but she always described this as the solution space is constrained. We don't have every solution that we read in a book, that we saw in a blog post, that we saw on YouTube. Uh, we just might not be able to do it. So we've had mixed success at this point, right? We're on the third attempt to, to implement DDD. So we've taught DDD. We've identified Greenfield and incremental projects. We've continued to use DDD, but only for our team's internal work. Domains and bounded context, Adrian, when Adrian was like talking about context all day long, I was like, I've, I've done it, I converted him. Um, but we are an HDD team, so we also needed to continue to think about the organizational structures, the contract boundaries, the system boundaries, and then we started thinking about what are the opportunities, what are the constraints that, that are created by all this. And then a weird thing happened. I changed the slide color to dark, because that's how we felt. Um, the term domain started getting adopted, but not the rest of DDD. It became um, just arbitrary buckets of features. Um, I think ball of mud is the correct term. But importance of bounded context and those nuances got lost outside of our team. So even though like, people were using the word domain, it was not going the way that we had hoped. So we pulled our heads back in our shells. Um, we continue to conduct research. We continue to apply HCD, domain-driven design to our approaches. We continue to recommend the, the approaches, but we, we stopped talking about DDD, unfortunately, at this point. But it would be pretty boring if we ended this talk here and <laughs> just like walked out. Um, it would be two more years. And then we got a chance to demonstrate these DDD practices. And this is where the prototype part uh, starts. Our stakeholders asked us to build a greenfield prototype. We named it the Modular Cloud Adjudication Prototype, or MCAP. Uh, if you've worked in government, everything has to have an acronym. The less letters in the acronym, the more important the thing is. So DDD had enabled us to conceptualize these domains, um, and we've, we knew that we needed to model this claim in a different way. So the legacy systems modeled the claims as a transactional-only model. And 
our expertise told us that it had to be modeled in a different way. Um, and so I realized something that we've, we've been talking about is that we have been coming up with our own explanations of what expertise is, uh, and we haven't been talking to other people. So we've been doing research this entire time, and one of the things we learned too is that we actually needed to become experts ourselves um, and without the benefit of being here for years and years. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we modeled the claims as both a highly regulated transaction, because that is what it is, but also an interaction between two human beings or an organization and a human being, right? A doctor or a medical provider providing patient care. That's also represented in this claim as well. So we knew that we had to change hearts and minds at CMS, right? That was actually the hardest part of this. Um, and so we had to build something that was incredibly real. It had to feel very, very real. It couldn't be a trivial thing. And, and Adrian explained all the complexities and the layers of that onion, right? So how do we create a prototype that represents all those layers effectively? The other thing is we had non-technical decision makers and stakeholders. So how do you demo database modeling? How do you demo APIs to this type of audience, right, who, who care about and are experts in their own right, but not at data modeling? And here's the other thing. We had to acknowledge that the legacy systems and its use cases are going to be around concurrently with whatever we suggest, whatever we build, right? And so we knew that, you know, I always called it the muddy middle. The muddy middle where both systems are running together is going to be decades. And so benefits. So we, we have a lot of things stacked <laughs> against us at this point. Um, we knew that the people and the processes were the key here. Right? We knew that we had to build a system that was um, helping the people that adjudicate these claims. And we knew that we also had to help the people that were building these systems to support that work. And so quickly walking through this, um, being able to support methods of future paying for care and policy that we don't even know yet. Right? So how do you build flexibility for something you don't know is coming? Actually, Eric talked about that this morning. So designing an architecture that's easier to maintain, more resistant to technical debt, and then reducing that effort when you need to make changes to the system. Being able to incrementally modernize and then keeping that backwards compatibility had to be rock solid. This, third, this fourth one is an interesting one, I think for particularly for people in government, which is we wanted to create a system that was correct, but we couldn't necessarily validate against the outputs of the existing systems. So instead, what you'll hear is we actually turned to the regulations. We created systems that were correct to the regulations, and that we actually could validate, that we could write end-to-end -end tests and unit tests. Um, obviously, data should resemble the business domain, but data accessibility is a, is a large challenge when your data is stuck in that vSAM and, and it's not accessible in the cloud. And finally, we really wanted to demonstrate best practices. We wanted to demonstrate that we can build modern, secure uh, systems but on government-approved cloud infrastructure, which today, I see the, the guy in the AWS uh, sweater on the back, is actually a lot. So we have a lot of really good tools, um, which wasn't necessarily true five years ago. One really, really important thing here is that MCAP was a concept car. It was not meant to be driven on the freeway or on actual roads. One of the things that we needed to do was allow ourselves to experiment in an extremely risk-averse organization. So our goal was not to go to production, which sounds bizarre to say on stage, um, but we wanted to learn, and we wanted to teach our team, and most importantly, we wanted to teach our stakeholders what are the possibilities in the future. And so one of the, our mantras became learn together. We invited everyone who wanted to attend. We uh, required our teammates, our designers, our product, our engineers to attend workshops and learning sessions. We wouldn't wait for anyone to sit down and write down the requirements for us. Instead, we forced everyone to go read regs. Um, and so I know most of you in the government work, or most of you in this room work in government, which I'm thrilled about, but you've probably read regs, and they're not fun, right? And so, but the fact that we sat down uh, with our annotated PDFs, with our notes, and went page by page, what's interesting on this page? Right, and created maps uh, and flow maps. And then engineers would create Excel spreadsheets to make sure that everyone on the team understood how the math worked. Um, and so we were learning together. And so in the end, after we started learning, we identified the thinnest possible thread, 
through the entire system, cutting across about five different domains. Um, and we settled on something that was an ambulance claim. Um, and we tracked it from the time that was the ambulance ride occurred to the time it was paid. Um, but again, this, this spanned five monoliths, dozen uh, data sources, and hundreds of pages of documentation. All right, so now I need to start tying the things back. Um, so tying this back to Eric's strategies. A bubble is a small bounded context, and we had to spend many, many domains crossing many bounded contexts. Essentially, this meant we needed a gallon of bubble solution. At the same time, we had to introduce event storming. So we learned together, um, but we would map these systems across a breadth that hadn't been done before. And that was the other interesting thing about our team is we had a charter to be able to go really, really wide, where a lot of the teams were specialized and focused on one thing. So this is a real slide. Uh, this is actually our event storm uh, artifact. It was in Miro, and um, it painted a picture from um, a non-emergency ambulance ride for a patient with end-stage renal disease, so extremely laser-focused, um, and again, cutting across the entire system. One fun thing, and I'm glad there's a lot of uh, civic tech people here, is that we found out that paper claims are fantastic for us. If you have forms and papers, it's really neat because these are complete models. These are valid claims, and they also fit in your head because it's only one page, right? And so it has everything you need on it, um, so it, ma it maps kind of the complexity really, really well. And this became the foundation. So you can see like this chart here on the right uh, in the background, but it became the foundation of how we describe regulations in a way that was really, really understandable to people. Um, and it's something that I hope uh, spreads beyond our team. Strategy number two. So our autonomous bubble starts here. So the paper claim is our mental model. Our EDI claim is what Medicare actually expects. And then the core claim is the beginning of our autonomous bubble. So we actually sync the core claim with the EDI claim. Right? So this is our primary aggregate that we have in our, uh, our prototype. And it's relational. Um, and then it stores kind of the state for orchestration. The ambulance claim is a second autonomous bubble. It's closely aligned to the core claim. I'll talk about this in a bit. Um, but it uses language that is in the policy. So ambulance type, mileage, those are things that are actually in the policy that you now see as a database column. Eric talks about exposing legacy to assets as services. And boy, do we have a lot of assets to expose. So flat files, um, we took these flat files, we wrapped them in APIs, we made them bi-temporal so you could actually time travel. Uh, you could actually adjudicate a claim from six months ago, for example. Um, we took a lot of existing REST APIs that were not intended for us to use, but we used them off-label. Uh, we wrapped them, we created brand new wrappers around those, um, and then we added all the variables, or sorry, all the vowels back into the variable names because that's pretty helpful, but when you're in COBOL and you're trying to save some bytes, anyways. Um, and then we didn't do as much work here, uh, but we did start to improve our developer experience. And so we were able to allow teams to extend our autonomous bubble without actually knowing um, how to deal with EDI. We improved API discovery and standards. We used orchestration and a shared kernel pattern within the core claims model. And then we used events uh, to implement choreography across the different bubble boundaries. And we also started thinking kind of ahead too. Like what would this look like for the, the next service beyond the ambulance? Um, and finally, uh, this is something that we're particularly happy about, is we collated all the events. So we had an event stream. We collated all the events, and then each day we would emit a legacy batch file, right? which is exactly what the systems needed. So we found a new way to essentially not extend COBOL, but still support the needs of COBOL as well. So at the end of our prototype, we achieved a couple of critical things. We learned um, how to implement policy that can't be built in a legacy mainframe system. We demonstrated how to build and validate software from the regulation, not the outputs of the existing system. And then we show the value of DDD mixed understanding extremely complicated domains within government. So government change happens at a glacial pace. I think as civic technologists in this room, we just have to be okay with that. Um, and our prototype wasn't intended for production, but it planted the seeds for possibilities with key decision makers and it showed the modern tech platforms were a viable alternative to continuing to extend the COBOL systems over and over again. And there's glimmers of hope. 
uh, new regulations just this year um, are being implemented outside the mainframe now. And we're starting to see some of these approaches. Uh, we don't know if we get credit for them, but we're happy that's happening. Um, but because we built this prototype, we're able to nudge people towards creating these spaces for innovations with bubbles. We're seeing ACLs, we're seeing um, service wrappers um, getting implemented. And we're, we're thrilled about that. So special thanks. Um, I want to definitely thank um, some of our partners at Agile 6 and our teammates. I want to thank our friends at CMS and digital services at CMS and USDS. Um, a couple of folks for reviewing our presentation, Nick and Indu for uh, encouraging us to submit the CFP. And of course, Eric, uh, thank you so much for writing that uh, pamphlet that just was so pivotal for us and made such a huge impact. So thank you for that. There's a couple other things in here as well. Uh, there's lots of lessons for commercial legacy and modernization I'm not going to go over. And then just some thoughts for our civic tech friends. Um, and then if you want to download the slides, take a picture of that barcode on the right-hand side. And then uh, there's our contact information on our websites if you uh, want to talk more or want to work with us. Thank you so much. Oh,